Well, hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining this Commsverse session, session 300 of, uh, of a large number of, uh, of sessions here at Converse. Uh, this one is titled, How Technology Supports My Role as a Volunteer Firefighter. All right, let's begin. So before we begin, I just want to give a huge shout out to each and every single sponsor that's helping Commsverse out. Commsverse literally would not exist without uh, each and every person on this list. So a huge shout out to each and every sponsor. Please do go check out the sponsor booths uh, within the Microsoft Teams channels. Go say hello to them. Go check out their products and services. Definitely well worth it. But a huge, huge thank you to each and every one of you who has uh, chosen to sponsor Converse this year. Bit of an introduction of uh, who I am. My name is Craig Tiffers. I'm a uh, principal architect at ICOM here in uh, Australia in, uh, in sunny Sydney. Or oh, I say sunny Sydney. It's uh, it's kind of cold here, I think, at the moment. It's about 10 degrees outside, so it's uh, definitely not sunny. Um, that's my day job. I'm also a Microsoft MVP focusing on, uh, on Microsoft Teams and Skype for Business, and I exist in the Office apps and services space. Um, I'm also a big fan of two wheels versus four, so those of you that ride motorcycles, um, Huge fan of the of the old motorcycles. My current baby uh, on the right hand side there is a, a Honda 650F at the moment. I try to ride there as much as I can, but obviously with the the cold weather that we're having here in Sydney at the moment, that is a little bit challenging. Um, but uh, try and get out on there as much as possible, of course. Um, now those two photos of me in the middle there, uh, that's kind of what we're going to focus on in today's session. And indeed, um, what today's session is entirely about. So um, there's a big crossover between what I do in my day job and playing around with technology and what I do in my volunteer role as a volunteer firefighter. So the image you see there uh, on the middle left in yellow, uh, that's me um, just after we had covered a tree and a house in firefighting foam, quite literally straight afterwards. So all that white gunk that you see all over me there, that's a good old firefighting foam. It doesn't taste very nice, but it's pretty good at putting out fires. Um, and the picture in orange there, that's uh, me volunteering with uh, the other emergency service here, the SES. Um, we deal a lot with fallen trees, hence the, uh, hence the chainsaw in that photo. But that's a little bit more about me. Uh, if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, uh, you can do my, my uh, hand, handle on Twitter is at cchiffers. You can check out my blog as well. I, I write quite a bit about uh, Microsoft Teams, Skype, and Office 365 as a whole. That's blog.tiffers.com. And if you're ever in Sydney, you can come and check out our meetup group, meetup.com forward slash Sydney UC. We talk all things uh, Skype and Teams. Um, now, I run that with uh, a fellow MVP, Greg Sheridan, that you may potentially have heard of. All right, that'll do for introductions for the moment. One thing I will say is uh, now typically this session is quite an interactive session. I like to run it as a uh, as a panel. Now today's session is being ran as a live event, but please feel free to call out any questions you have. Now I'm currently presenting and producing this event all in one go, all by myself, but I do have the questions and answers screen in front of me right now. So if you have a burning question, uh, no pun intended, feel free to just chuck it in the Q&A and um, I'll try to get to it throughout today's session where I can. Now, off the back of that, of course, uh, we are going to have the breakout room and the breakout session after today's session. If you have a look at the q and I've included the link um, where you can go to join that breakout session after today's session. Um, one thing I will say, though, is today is actually uh, my other half's birthday and we have dinner reservations this evening, so I won't be sticking around too long, but I do promise to, uh, to pop in, say hello and uh, answer any quick questions that you guys have. I am also doing a giveaway during today's session too. So if you want to win a, a physical paperback book version copy of Adopt and Embrace Microsoft Teams, just scan that QR code 
with your phone. So pull your iPhone out or your Android device, open up your camera app and hover it over that QR code on your screen. And a little bar should appear at the top of the screen. Just give that a tap and uh, you'll be able to enter the competition. So all, all I'm doing is asking for your, uh, your name and email address, purely used just for the competition. So don't worry, I won't fill up your mailbox with spam. If you win, you'll get an email from me just asking for some further details from you. Now, if your phone doesn't support QR codes or you're watching this on a computer, you can just browse to that URL that's on the screen there as well. So I'll just leave that up there for two seconds whilst you guys uh, pull your phones out or browse to that URL. Beautiful. All right, so we're going to cover three topics uh, in today's session. I've got about 30 or so minutes to cover these, so we'll see how we go. Um, I want to talk about the Australian fire season, specifically the end of 2019 going into 2020. Uh, and uh, my, uh, my specific uh, insights and experience into that as a, uh, as a firefighter. Um, I also want to touch on technology and how it plays such a massive part in everything that we do today, including volunteering. And lastly, I want to talk about how we can use technology and potentially shift the working culture to better enable your and mine and everyone else's users to achieve more. Let's dive straight into it. So we'll start with the Australian fire season. Now, depending on where you are uh, right now uh, watching this content, perhaps you're watching it live or perhaps you're watching the, um, the re-recording of this session, um, you probably heard about the Australian uh, bushfires uh, at, the, at the very end of 2019. So one of the biggest ones that we had uh, in, initiated in an area of New South Wales called Gospers Mountain. It's part of the Wollamai National Park and it exists um, several hundred kilometres kind of northwest of Sydney. Uh, however, um, it was and still is the largest forest fire to have ever started from a single ignition source in Australia. So how did it start? Well, back on October 26th of 2019, uh, sometime uh, in the, uh, I believe in the late afternoon, there was a, a lightning strike in a really remote part of the bush. Lightning strike struck a tree, tree ignited, and that started what was to become the largest forest fire ever in Australia to exist and to start from a single ignition source. It was to burn over 800,000 hectares, 800,000 hectares. To put that into perspective, that's about three times the size of Greater London. So not just the, the little bit in the middle with London, we're talking Greater London, we're talking around um, the bit that sits inside of the M25. Imagine three times that size being burnt out. That's a huge fire, right? But my story actually starts on the other side of the world in, uh, in New York City. And in fact, in Orlando prior to that. So back in November, um, for those of you uh, that probably attended Ignite, um, I attended Ignite as well. So down in uh, Orlando in Florida, Microsoft put on Ignite. Um, myself and my fellow colleagues from ICOM, we all attended that event, uh, had a great time. I spent a lot of time talking to customers about Microsoft Teams uh, in, in the hub area. Um, if you've ever been to Ignite, this was actually my first experience uh, at Ignite, but if you've ever been to Ignite, um, you'll know that the, uh, the, the hub or the, the, the kind of showroom floor is enormous. Um, to, to prove a point, um, I, I got there and um, you probably can't see on camera, but I wore my leather shoes. Um, after day one, I uh, took a cab or an Uber to the local mall and bought myself some, uh, some sneakers or some, uh, some running shoes, as we call them in Australia, uh, quite literally because my feet were on fire, uh, because you do a lot of walking at Ignite, and it is massive, it's huge. Um, but that's where this story begins. So I'd left Ignite, and I wanted to spend a couple of days um, prior to flying back to Australia, because between Sydney and the US, um, that's, a, that's a long flight. It's at least 13, if not 14 or 15 hours just to get to Los Angeles. So we like to sort of use the time whilst we're over there. Um, so I decided to go to New York City. Uh, spent uh, a couple of days in New York City walking around. It was quite cold there. I went up the top of the World Trade Center, the new World Trade Center, 
um, took some photos up there. Beautiful, beautiful, stunning building. Uh, went up the Empire State Building as well. Um, and uh, one of the evenings, I, um, I decided to spend a, a little bit of time in a bar that uh, a, a fellow RFS um, firefighter friend of mine recommended called O'Hara's in, uh, in New York City. Now, this bar, what's special about it is it's about 50 meters from the original site of the World Trade Center towers. So if you were to walk out of what is today uh, the ponds um, where, where the, the, the towers stood and you stand on the corner there, you can actually see this bar. It's only it's literally within 50 meters um, and it pretty much got mainly uh, mostly destroyed when those towers came down. Thankfully, they've restored it. Um, and they've covered the walls in there with with all of these uh, all of these patches that you can see here. In fact, whilst I was there, I, I came across uh, a state emergency service patch for New South Wales, part of the service that I'm with um, on the wall. So I took a photo of it. Um, I uh, but whilst I was there as well, uh, my my friend pointed out. He said you have to ask for the book. He said go up to the bar and ask for the book. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And so I kind of thought, oh, yeah, this is a bit of an in-joke, right? I'm going to walk up to the bar, ask for the book, and they're, they're going to hit me over the head with, a, with a, a bottle or something or whatever it is that they do. But no, um, so I asked for the book, and out comes this, uh, this leather-bound um, leather book uh, that's thicker than a, a yellow pages, if you're still familiar with what one of those is. Um, several inches thick. Um, I started flicking through it, and there's all these, uh, all these fascinating photos of what happened on September 11th, 2001, um, when, those, when those towers came down and, and pictures that people have probably never seen before or never been published. So it's kind of a, a snapshot in time, kind of even before uh, technology and, and camera phones were, were really uh, super popular, right? So it's kind of a, a piece of history right there, but you physically have to go to this bar to be able to see that history. But it was fascinating to be able to flick through it. Um, the other, other photo that you see there in the bottom right hand corner, um, that was a, uh, a gentleman that I, uh, that I met. I, I forget the guy's name, um, but um, me and him uh, <laughs> consumed copious amounts of alcohol that evening. Um, now, the point of the story is uh, towards the end of the evening, um, we're sat there in the bar and you can kind of see the, uh, the, the TV behind me there in that photo, but there were several TVs in this bar. And I'm chatting away, having having drinks with this guy, talking about um, you know what I do back in Australia. And I'm looking up at the TV, and all of a sudden uh, I, I see this footage being played on the TV, and it's of a fire truck uh, driving through the bush, and surrounding the fire truck is fire, effectively. Uh, and what stands out for me uh, in this footage is, as um, you'll know if you're a member of the RFS, that each of our trucks has a number imprinted on it on the inside and the number's clear as day. It's designed so you know what, what truck you're in uh, in the event of an emergency so you can jump on the radio and call for help and you can tell them uh, clear as day what truck it is you're in. There's no confusion there whatsoever. Now I saw the truck number that was in the video um, and it was it was our truck. It was the part of um, part of Davidson. So I'm I'm part of the, the Davidson Brigade as a rural firefighter and I saw that it was our truck. Uh, that was dr dr literally driving through a, a forest that was on fire. And I thought, geez, this is the first time that it really struck me. Like, you know, what's going back, what's going on back in Australia? I actually have the video here for you. So let me just play this for you a second.
really harrowing stuff and really sobering stuff. So the, uh, the, the first part of the footage there you saw was someone filming in the back. That's uh, a friend of mine, Joey. Uh, he, he's part of the Davidson Brigade and he was sat in the back of the truck. Um, we've got Elliot driving and we've got James um, sat in the front seat there with a the red helmet. And so I'm sat there in this bar in New York City and I'm pointing at the TV saying, that, that they're my friends. Like, you know, what's going on? Um, here's a couple of other photos of our brigade as well. So um, the photo on the right there shows some of our vehicles that we've got. The photo, um, the, the footage was taken from um, our, uh, our truck in the middle there, which is, uh, which is Davison 1. So um, nice and shiny now, of course, but um, after, after obviously being prepared for the, uh, for the season. Um, the photo on the left there of, um, of the brigade, our, our brigade up at Davison is probably one of the biggest um, in the district. We've got over 100 members, uh, much more than what you see just in that photo there today. So uh, that's, I, I guess there's some of the, uh, some of, some of the people that were active um, <laughs> on the day that that photo was taken. Um, but um, yeah, it was really sobering to, to see that footage. And that footage has been played um, globally around the world. In fact, I even saw screenshots of it uh, on, uh, on newspapers here, uh, here in Australia. So one of the other things um, that we can use uh, here that we have at our disposal is the fire service um, fires near me application. Uh, and this, this is a web application that shows the current status of fires in New South Wales. Now each state in Australia has their own version of this app. And there is a version of this app available that shows that collectively all of the data from across Australia. But this is the one that we use here in New South Wales. Um, and of course, you're able to access this information globally because it's available on the internet. So I'm sat there in this bar um, with my phone, looking at this information, thinking, geez, look at the size of that. That's, uh, that fire is growing. And if you look at this map, um, so the blue dots uh, just below where it says Wollamai National Park, um, just over here, uh, that, that is the ignition source for the Gospers Mountain Fire, what was to become the, the, the 800,000 hectare fire. And you can see the fire just to the uh, to the, the west of Sydney in the uh, uh, the Karangaboy uh, National Park there, and you can almost see how those fires are starting to converge, right, turn into a, a mega fire. So this is a pretty serious uh, situation. And I believe the screenshot that I took of this back then was um, was, was uh, late October, early November. So you know the situation had only just begun, and things were already looking pretty serious. Of course, you know, jumping into the news media as well, um, I typed in Australia into, uh, into search and hit images and my screen was filled with orange. Effectively, you know, uh, the, 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 from, from uh, the news media's point of view, the state was on fire. Um, so I couldn't really wait to get home and, uh, and help. Uh, so fast forward to November 21st, um, I'm, uh, I've landed back in Sydney and those of you that have traveled um, over to the US, you, you will know that to travel to the US kind of screws up your body clock, right? So you get back to, to Sydney and, uh, or somewhere else in Australia, and you're kind of wide awake at two o'clock in the morning and you're, you feel kind of sleepy at two o'clock in the afternoon. And so um, because my body clock was flipped reversed uh, and they needed firefighters to work overnight on this fire, um, because firefighting is not just a nine to five thing, it, it happens 24 seven, right? Um, I jumped on the, on the first available truck and, uh, and headed out overnight uh, up to Gospers Mountain. So this, is, this photo here is of the staging area of, um, of Gospers Mountain. Uh, so what you'll see here is just a whole bunch of fire trucks and equipment and lighting, et cetera, where we all come together. We all get a briefing about what it is we're going to do before we break off into what's called a strike team. And the strike team is effectively a group of vehicles um, with different capabilities to, uh, to target an area and work on that area. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we were up against, right? So uh, it's a photo of me that someone else took putting the, uh, the wet stuff on the red stuff, as we like to say. Uh, so, somewhere around uh, the Blue Mountains, I believe this photo was, um, yeah, late November. Uh, but yeah, that's the, the, the typical kind of scenario that we're faced with. And of course, we only have limited amounts of water available on the truck as well, right? So we're constantly in communication um, back with command and control via radio or via phone or via satellite if we need it uh, to be able to update them on what it is that's going on and how much water we need. Um, we also do quite a bit of this as well. This is uh, called back burning, a little bit different to hazard reduction burning. So back burning 
is what you'll see us doing when we're active. That's where we light the bush up on purpose uh, to hopefully clear the land so that when the fire front comes through, it's got nothing to burn and it burns out, right? So we, we, we spent a lot of time uh, doing this up at Gospers, spent a lot of time doing this up at the Blue Mountains. Um, and you'll notice that that photo is daylight. Uh, that's because that's morning there, very, very early morning. So we've gone up, uh, I, I finished the, my, my day job for the day. I've left, I've jumped in the truck about 6 p.m. We've arrived up there about 8 p.m. Uh, and we get to work and we work all night and then we get up in the morning and we work a little bit more. We have about 40, 40 to 45 minutes sleep on the ground or in the truck or wherever we can and we, uh, we get going. If we're lucky, we might have some coffee um, the uh, the instant kind, which uh, let, let me tell you, when you've only had 45 minutes of sleep, it, um, it does wonders. You'll drink anything, trust me. We don't have coffee machines on the truck, unfortunately. Um, but uh, of course, whilst I'm doing this, I also have a day job uh, to go back to in the morning, right? And so I found myself in this situation um, where we would be uh, you know, on, on our way back um, from, from a fire. And in this situation, this was on our way back from, um, from the Blue Mountains. Uh, no, sorry, from Gosford's this was. And um, we'd left a little bit late and I had a conference call scheduled at 10 a.m. that morning um, with a customer to talk through a proposal document. And we'd left too late and I'm sat there in the truck thinking, all right, well, it's a two hour journey back to Sydney and my call starts in 20 minutes. And it's too late now to cancel with the customer. What do I do? Well, I've got my mobile phone on me. I've got 4G data. I have a headset or my headphones on me. What do I do? Well, instead of canceling the meeting, I fired up the Teams client and I joined the meeting. Easy as that. I shared the screen on my phone and I talked through that proposal. That customer had absolutely no idea that I was traveling at that point, uh, on a car ferry in the back of a fire truck. As far as they were concerned, I was attending that meeting. I was talking through the proposal document and I was getting the outcome that was required. The technology had my back and I could trust it regardless of wherever I was. As long as I had internet connectivity and a suitable device and a headset, I was good to go. And so, of course, doing that enabled me to feel a lot more comfortable with having Teams calls in really random places. Um, this is what the inside of a fire truck looks like, if you've ever wondered. Um, so it's pretty cramped in there, right? There's uh, a lot of gear going on. So you can see our helmets there. Those red blankets, if you've ever seen those before and wonder what they are, they're effectively used um, in the event that we experience something called an overrun. And an overrun is where um, all of a sudden the wind changes and the fire front is coming at us. And so we jump into the truck. You can see those, um, those aluminium um, or foil looking colored, gray colored, silver colored looking um, uh, roller blinds at the very front of the truck. And you can see them at the sides as well. We roll those down, we below the window line, The same thing happened from uh, the back of coaches as well. You can see me sticking my head out there in the corner along with uh, a few of my colleagues. Um, we spent a lot, a lot of time on coaches um, at really random times of the day. And again, Office 365 and Microsoft Teams allowed me to do that. The technology worked. I was able to dial in and join my calls. Now, embarrassingly, I did actually, I will hold my hand up. I'd had about 20 minutes of sleep. We'd been out all night. We worked really hard. I'm sat on the coach. I've dialed into the call. And I, I, the last thing I remember is someone talking about numbers or figures or something. And I literally fell asleep on the call. Luckily, I, I was on mute, so no one heard me snoring. And I woke up and the call had ended and everything was fine. But um, <laughs> that, that literally happened. I fell asleep on a team school. Um, but yeah, look. The, uh, the technology allowed me to do that, right? And so I felt comfortable finishing up with work, going out all night and fighting fires, and then attending work the next day and being able to do my job regardless of where I was. Now, it's not just Teams 
um, that I use in my in my day to day role as a uh, a firefighter in the RFS. There's several different applications that we use. Here's a number of them, right? So we use an application called Rover. So back in the day, um, and still to this day in certain areas, people use pagers so that when you uh, call for help and uh, you know they need to page the firefighters to station, um, they will literally do that. They'll send out a page and it will beep on someone's pager. That's really old school, right? I mean, everyone carries around one of these with them these days, a smartphone. Uh, and so instead of having the physical pager, we just have an app on our phones, coupled with the ability to be able to see what everyone else is doing and as well see where everyone is on the map so that when we get a fire call, and we say, yep, we're responding to this, we're going, we can see where absolutely everyone is and how long they're going to take to get to station. So we can plan accordingly, even before people have arrived. An app that we used a lot down south in Balmoral, and I'll show you a couple of photos of Balmoral and you'll, you'll understand why, um, was the Emergency Plus app. Now, if you're in Australia, I highly recommend you download this application. If you're overseas, there's probably something that you can use that's very similar. What this application will do is give you your latitude and longitude, your location, as well as the current address where you're at. So in the event that you're driving somewhere and you have an accident or you need to call triple O or 999 or 911, et cetera, um, you can do that. And the app will allow you to do that. And you can give your specific location as to where you are right from the app there. So really, really, really handy app. And of course, Microsoft Teams there as well. Use that very, very heavily across the RFS and in my uh, in my day to day life as well. Um, now, a couple of photos from Balmoral down south. Now, you may have heard um, about Balmoral. Balmoral was an area that got um, uh, hit really badly, very, very badly. We spent a lot of time down there um, helping the community out, checking people's welfare. Um, and as you can see from this photo here, like the kind of environments that we were walking into were pretty much disaster zones. Um, Obviously, that electricity pole there should not be at that angle. And further down the road, um, that's, uh, there were wires all over the place. Now, luckily, the power had been cut to the, uh, to the village, so we were safe. Um, but it gives you an impression of the kind of areas that we're walking into there. Um, this was after daybreak um, in Balmoral. Now, going back to why I used or why we were using that Emergency Plus app is, you know, tell me what the address is of that property. No one's got any idea. I could probably tell you what street you're on. But, um, you know, without a, a physical marker uh, or number or whatever, it's, it's very difficult to know what was there originally and, um, and what number it is. So we opened up the Emergency Plus app on our phone and just took note of what the app said the address was at the time. So we could log that in our reports and report back and say, yeah, you know, structure destroyed or structure partially destroyed, et cetera, and show that we've checked it. Um, really, really handy app to have. Now, there are some lighter things that happen as well on the fire ground. Um, we had uh, just got paged, uh, called to a, a house where um, part of the house was still alight. So we got there, we put that out, and then the owner turned up with um, his, uh, his puppy, uh, three-legged puppy as well. But that certainly did not stop the puppy from wanting to play. So here's, uh, here's me and a couple of our colleagues playing around with, um, with one of the many, many animals um, that, that we got to meet. Uh, throughout the role, kangaroos, uh, dogs, emus, oh, you name it, we, uh, we saw it, absolutely. But one of the lighter sides of the job is, you know, you, you, you get to play with some pretty cool animals all at the same time. Now, one of the, uh, one of the things that's often overlooked, um, and one of the things that I certainly overlooked when I first of all went out on my first deployment was uh, how I would communicate with my partner, my other half, Lee. Uh, I mean, it, it's vital to keep people updated as to what's happening about your welfare. I mean, I was disappearing for 13, 14, 15 hours at a time, and Lee had a rough idea of where I was going, right? There's a photo of her um, and a terrible photo of me, but um, that's uh, we're on an airplane going to uh, Melbourne, I believe, for a bit of a break there. Um, so, so she's certainly the better half. Uh, but really important that, um, that, that her and I communicate and I try and tell her where I am, right? And I got that wrong, first of all. The first time I got deployed, I got that really wrong. I thought that when I got there, I'd be able to send her an SMS and be like, hey, I'm here, we've arrived, everything's cool, take a, take a couple of photos, um, keep her updated throughout the night. I didn't take into account that, that we were going into areas that had no comms. 
the comms uh, towers, the mobile phone reception towers have been destroyed uh, with the fire, right? So there was, there was no way of being able to communicate with Lee effectively. And so we worked out a bit of a method instead. So instead of, uh, instead of me sending her SMSs, I just shared my location with her. So anytime that my phone got a ping off of a tower, it would be able to update her with my current location. So at least she would have some kind of uh, peace and uh, uh, in knowing effectively potentially where I was at the time. May not be able to communicate with me straight away, but at least she gets a little bit of sense of security knowing, oh, all right, well, he's here, he's there, he's still moving, <laughs> he's still somewhat alive. One of the other things that we use quite heavily as well in the house, um, because it's it's vitally important that uh, uh, not only you know during my working life but my volunteering life uh, that I'm able to continue to keep the household running. I mean, bills don't stop needing to be paid, pets don't stop needing to be fed, uh, chores don't stop needing to be done, work doesn't stop needing to be done, right? Shopping lists, keeping things updated, communication, none of that stops just because I'm away putting uh, water on a fire with the RFS or at work. Uh, and so what we found is that it's absolutely critical uh, that we try to remain in contact where possible. And one of the things that we did, both Lee and I, invested heavily in, uh, in our apartment and our daily lives is automation and communication. A word that you will hear very, very often um, in our household is, hey Google or hey Alexa. Um, every single uh, room has a smart device in it, a, a smart speaker in it, Google or Alexa, every single room. All of the light bulbs in our house are all completely smart. So we can turn on and off the lights regardless of where we are. We've got cameras throughout the house. I've got a, a ring doorbell. Everything about the house is automated, including the air conditioning as, as well. So if her and I are gonna be out for the day and we need to keep, make sure the cats are okay uh, and then we need to feed them remotely, we can do all of that. I can do that from the back of a fire truck via an app if I need to. She can do that from her phone as well, regardless of where she is. We don't have to keep checking in on each other. Now, one of the other things uh, that, that we do is we share, cal we share calendars. Um, however, I use Office 365. She uses Google Mail and we have Google devices throughout the house. Now, those of you that have attempted to will know that Google devices, uh, the, the smart devices will not be able to read a, uh, an exchange calendar. And so to solve this problem and to make sure that all of the devices in the house are in sync and all the calendars are in sync and we know what each other uh, are doing, um, I built a flow using Power Automate to sync my data from my Exchange mailbox calendar, my work calendar, over to the Google Home calendaring system. So anytime I make an update on my calendar on my phone, it automatically syncs to my Google devices in the house so that when Lee walks in, she goes, oh, Craig's working late tonight or Craig's out to dinner tonight. She can see that at a glance on the Google Home. She can also see that on her phone as well and vice versa. If she adds details to her calendar, I can see those details too. And this is just one example of what's possible with, with Power Automate. Of course, you could create some smarts with Power Automate that says, um, when Craig gets home at 6 p.m., turn the lights on automatically if you want. You know, you're kind of only limited um, in your ability with Power Automate uh, with your imagination. Highly, highly recommend checking out Power Automate, which is the, uh, the new version of Flow. Just go to flow.microsoft.com. Take a look. Very, very powerful stuff. Uh, I spoke before briefly about the pet feeder that we have in the house. Um, it has a camera on it, so I'm able to see what's going on in the house and uh, see that the cats are eating remotely. Um, we use any list for our shopping list. So Lee can say, hey, Google, add toothpaste to the shopping list. And that'll sync to both my phone and her phone. So I don't even need to call her and say, what do we need from the store? I walk into the store and I pick the items off the list. Simple as that. Um, we also do use push to talk between each other as well. We use the Zello app. Uh, if you haven't downloaded Zello, it's effectively a walkie-talkie app for your phone. So um, 
but it works using the cellular network, right? So uh, we don't need to be within range of each other. As long as we're in range of a, a 3G or 4G network or a Wi-Fi network, we can walkie-talkie each other. So if I need to get uh, Lee's attention really quickly um, to ask her a, a quick question about something, I can just yellow her. Simple as that. So the last thing I want to talk about is how we kind of bring all of this together, the technology, the volunteering, the, the working, uh, you know, 12 hours a day. And how does that how does that even work? Like, how do you find the time to do something like that? Well, I thought about this and uh, I realized that really there's three critical components uh, to, to being able to do what I do, being able to work during the day, volunteer during the evening, and keeping everything running, keeping everything in sync. Now, the first one is a no-brainer. It's Office 365. It's a cloud service. Make no mistake, without Office 365, without that cloud service, without Teams, without calendaring, without being able to store my documents in, in the cloud and access them remotely on my mobile phone when I'm in the bush, you know, 300 kilometers from civilization, without that, I would not be able to volunteer because I wouldn't feel comfortable enough to be able to go into the bush and volunteer knowing that I may be late for a customer meeting and I may be caught short because I don't have a document or I can't join the, uh, the video session. Office 365 allows me to do that. The second thing is uh, a supporting, uh, st putting, supporting lifestyle at home and a supportive home in general. Now, Lee plays a big part in that. So without Lee, I would not be able to do what I do. So she keeps the household running whilst I'm away, uh, whilst I'm doing RFS stuff, right? But if I need to jump on and feed the cats, or if I need to jump on and turn the air conditioning on, or if I need to add items to the shopping list or pay a bill remotely, I can do that. But I have the support and the buy-in from Lee to be able to do those things at the same time, because without that, I wouldn't be able to. And thirdly, ICOM, my employer, because without ICOM, trusting me in the ability to be able to go out in the middle of the night and respond to fire calls, go 300 kilometers into the bush and, and respond to fires and, and spend all night and have the support of them and, the, and you know, the trust of them to know that I will be on that phone call at 9 a.m. with a customer. I will get that document signed and delivered on time. I will be present in the meeting. Without the support of the employer and the culture of the employer as well. So being able to work from home, being able to work different hours, um, being able to respond and work whenever it suits me and whenever it suits the customer as well, but not being locked down to having to come into an office, uh, having to sit down at a desk and you know to, to make a phone call or walk into a meeting room to jo join a meeting. Having a supportive employer and supportive culture ultimately enables me to be able to do so much with my day. Those three things are absolutely critical. Cloud service, a supportive and understanding home life and partner, and a supportive and understanding culture with your employer. And speaking of Lee, she's actually just walked into the room. Um, I, I'd have to rotate everything for you to be able to see her, but she is over there. And lastly, you need to be able to support your people. I spoke before about having a supportive employer, right? But it really comes down to be able to support the people in your organization to do what it is that they want to do. So firstly, let people work wherever and whenever they choose. If, um, if Susie in accounts wants to start at 10 a.m. Uh, because she needs to drop her kids off at school and she needs to update a document on the way uh, and she needs to uh, continue working from home in the evening to get something done, let her do that. Don't throw barriers at her. Don't, don't make her dial into a VPN or use a VPN token or have to be in a certain location to access certain documents. People want choice and the ability to be able to do what it is that they want to do. Give them that choice. Of course, ensure that you train people in how to use the tools effectively. I knew that I could trust Teams when I connected to that call from the back of the fire truck because I understood the technology and I knew how it worked and I knew what to do if it didn't work. Ensure that your users understand how to use the tools, but more effectively, 
uh, more importantly, what to do when things go wrong. So if things don't go to plan, what's the backup plan? Do they dial into the meeting using the conferencing service number and a phone number instead or an, and a pin? Make sure they understand how to troubleshoot effectively and quickly and, and essentially solve the problem. And as I said before, ensure that your tools enable your people rather than getting in the way. Don't throw up um, ridiculous amounts of MFA prompts for users who are working outside of the office. Make sure the tools are suitable. Make sure they're running the most up-to-date version of software. Make sure that, uh, that, you know, that they're using laptops as opposed to desktops. Make sure they're using uh, you know, soft clients to make phone calls. We give employers, I see this time and time again, you give employers laptops and you say, work remotely, but then you give them a desk phone and you say, well, to make a phone call, you've actually got to come into the, into the office and use the phone on the desk. You're giving people mixed, mixed messages, right? So make sure you give them the tools to do what it is that they do best and make sure the tools get out of the way. And just on that, uh, if you're looking at rolling out Microsoft Teams, there is a plethora of devices that are available today. Um, the ones on the left are shared devices. They're the ones that you'll use in a typical meeting room space. They're called uh, Microsoft Teams room systems or collab bars if you want the smaller version. The devices in the middle there are more than likely what you're interested in. They're the personal devices. One thing I'll point out though is I do have a pair of the, of the uh, Jabra Evolve 65Ts. I also have an Alara 60 set on my desk. And I do have a, a version of that uh, Plantronics Blackwire headset. I've got the, the wireless version of it. The thing to point out there is even though all three of those devices are certified for Microsoft Teams, they aren't all to be used uh, in, uh, in certain situations, right? So for instance, the, the 65Ts work really well as uh, audio consumption devices. So listening to podcasts, listening to music, listening to meetings. But if I step outside into a noisy environment, and I try to unmute myself and start taking part in a meeting, everyone else on the call is gonna hear all that background noise because the microphones on that device are tiny. Of course, the same thing could be said for the, for the Alara 60, perfect desk device, but again, you're tying people to a desk. So would you buy two of those? So what a person could have one in the office and one at home, or would you potentially just get them a, a headset instead? So they have the option of being able to use Teams regardless of where they are. And I personally like the corded headsets. You plug them in via USB, but some of them do have the option of uh, connecting to your phone or your laptop via Bluetooth as well. They have got the boom mic as well, so you can put the microphone directly in front of your face and they cancel out noise uh, behind you and, and around you. So really, really effective and quick way of getting people up and running with Teams voice. Um, the other devices you can see there are the desk phones and the uh, personal speakerphone devices there as well. So I use one of those at home. I've got the, uh, the poly version of the, uh, the, the Bluetooth speaker. So I have that just sat on my desk at home and I use that to join conference calls. Really, really great to bring three, four, five people in a huddle room into a Teams call with really good sounding audio as opposed to just using the laptop PC um, speaker and mic that's built into the device that not necessarily doesn't support echo cancellation. Now, of course, if all of that fails, you can always rely on coffee, right? Coffee makes the world go around. And coffee that day lit my world up, uh, me, me and my friend's world up. We had just finished um, up in the Blue Mountains, very early morning, six o'clock, uh, stopped at a servo and um, got shattered free coffee. And uh, that really made my day. Thank you so much for coming to this session. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, if you want to continue this conversation, I will be jumping into the, uh, the breakout session. All you need to do is go to goteams.fans forward slash BRK300. I have also pasted that link into the, uh, the Q&A chat on the right-hand side of the screen there. Thank you so much for joining this session. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of Converse.